Good afternoon. Welcome to uh, this afternoon's uh, Tech Talk. Uh, I'm Brad Chen. I work on performance tools in the system infrastructure group. And I'm delighted to introduce Marty Itkowitz, um, who's uh, project lead uh, at uh, Sun on their uh, performance analyzer. Before that, he was one of the main contributors, or perhaps the architect even, of SGI Speed Shop. And, uh, and hopefully, you'll mention some of the other fascinating projects you've worked on. Anyways, Marty, welcome to uh, Google. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, my name is Marty Iskos, as Brad said. I'm the project lead for the Sun Studio Performance Tools, and I've been doing performance tools for quite a long time. What I'm going to talk about today are the issues involved in building what I call industrial strength performance tools. That is, tools that can be used by a J random user on whatever application they're working on, and they just kind of need to work well and easily to use. So with that, um, there's an outline. I'll first talk about the requirements. That is, how I see the issues that are important in developing such tools. And then I'll talk about, move on to what the user model would be. First, talking about how you compile the code in order to do measurements, how you do data collection and what the trade-offs with various technologies are, how you present the data, and how you deal with, I'll, I'll deal with two particular tricky bits of presentation. One is to show Java, and the other is to show OpenMP. And lastly, I'll talk about how you validate it. How do you know that your tool is giving the right answers? So what are the requirements? The main requirement is that the tool has to be easy to use. It needs a very simple user model. Uh, we think it's important to have one tool that is one interface to learn for all kinds of performance data, whatever you might want to collect. And that it's very important to present the data in the context of the user's programming model. That is, the user wrote something, and even if that's not how things run, the user wants to see the performance information in terms of what they wrote. The objective of the tools is to make things as simple as possible, but no simpler, to paraphrase Einstein. The important thing is to make sure that the user has to do minimal effort minimal number of mouse clicks to get to the aha point, the point at which they slap their head and say, what idiot wrote that? Um, it's important also to have trustworthy data. And that means the data has to be tested and validated. And the tools have to be bulletproof. Unlike special purpose tools where you can get away with having it work most of the time, if you're selling a tool or even if you're giving it away into an audience, you need to make sure that the tools do get it all right. So, and you also need to make them absolutely robust. So what's the user model? The user model we're fond of is pretty simple. Three steps. Compile the target. Um, and that means if you're trying to measure some production code, you need to compile the target just the way you would for production use. Um, optimization, parallelization. It's often uninteresting to tune an unoptimized program because the hotspots in the unoptimized code have no relationship to the hotspots that will show up in the production system. Second step is to collect the data. And that means a command that says, I want to collect this kind of data on this target run with these arguments. And we do that. And we have options to say, what, kind, you know, what are the different kinds of data you collect and which ones do you want? And we do a lot of consistency checking to make sure the user doesn't ask for things that really cannot be done together. The options all specify what kind of data you want on this target. And the last step is to examine the data. And you can do that either by a GUI or by a command line. Um, there are certainly some class of people who think that real programmers don't use GUIs, so we have to have command line. But command line is also useful for other things. And I'll talk about that a bit later. So first of all, compiling the target. It's we think, I think, it's important to avoid having to do some special compilation for doing measurement. And there are a couple of reasons for that. One reason is that any special compilation is a barrier to use. Some industrial codes, like one big database code whose name I won't mention, takes almost 24 hours to compile. So if you have to decide you want to do a particular kind of measurement, you don't want to have to spend 24 hours recompiling it for that measurement. And it's also true that if you do some kind of special compilation to do instrumentation, 
you're running a different program. Uh, sometimes that program is close enough that it will point you at the right places, but sometimes it's not at all. Sometimes it's really, you've got a different program, and again, just like turning off optimization, you're doing a measurement on a different code from the one you're trying, that you care about. There are times, however, where you really do have to do something. There are times when some kinds of information cannot be obtained except by recompiling, and then you do it. And we can do that for some kinds of data. Um, we do it in particular to prepare to get count data, how many times a function was called or an instruction was executed. And we also can do some not quite performance work, but what I would call correctness work. We can do data race detection, and for that, we again need to do a special compilation. Um, it's important to allow all the optimizations and parallelization, even though they may greatly complicate your life in terms of interpreting the data. Um, for example, if you do common sub-expression elimination, which is a very common compiler optimization, you can get some pretty funny behaviors. In particular, you can see profile hits on a line of code that you know is never actually executed because it had an expression common with what you are executing, and the compiler simply tagged that code to generate that with the wrong line number. Well, wrong in this context line number. You also need to understand what happens when the compiler optimizes loops, doing loop fusion, loop fission, when functions are inline, when bits of code are taken and outlined, when functions are cloned, as for example you would do if you have a function that takes a parameter. You might want to have one piece of code for any parameter and another piece of code if the parameter is fixed by the call. Parallelization makes life even more complicated in the Sun compilers and in almost every compiler I know of. Parallelization is done by abstracting the body of the loop being parallelized into a separate function. Sun's terms, that's called an M function. Other, co other compilers call it an outline function. And how those functions appear and how they interact, how they show as being called in the rest of the program is an important issue. And I'll talk about that in some detail later. Another interesting thing that's in the Sun tools and was also in, in the Sun compilers and in the SGI compilers are compiler commentary. The compilers often know an awful lot about the code they have compiled and they can tell you that information. It's sometimes really interesting to know, for example, this particular loop was not parallelized because the compiler detected a data dependency on one particular element. Or, you couldn't parallelize this loop because it couldn't tell whether it was safe if you have A of B of I equals something. If B of I is what's called a permutation vector, that is, you know for sure that no B of I's, no two B of I's have the same value, it's safe to run in parallel. If you don't know that, you can't make that assumption. So it's often helpful to have the compiler tell you stuff Sometimes you know enough about the code to be able to insert an assertion or a pragma that says it's okay to do this because I know this is true. I know it. I know this construct is a permutation vector. I know this function is safe to call in multi-threaded code. So that's all I want to say about how you go about compiling the code. I'll now talk about the data collection issues. There are two really important issues in data collection which I refer to as dilation and distortion. Dilation is the delta in runtime between the uninstrumented, unmeasured code and the instrumented measured code. In general, dilation is tolerable. It often doesn't matter if you're doing a performance measurement and the code slows down for 5% or 10%. Sometimes even 50%, it doesn't really matter as long as you get the information that tells you what would happen in the uninstrumented code. Now, if you're trying to do measurements on production codes, in production, 50% dilation can be fatal. But in general, dilation is much more tolerable than distortion. Again, dilation, if it passes the, the user's tolerance for delays, is not acceptable. Distortion is far more serious. What distortion does is it changes the relative weight of different sections of code and therefore may really produce misleading results. If, for example, you instrument for function counts and 
Small functions may have very high overhead. Large functions will have negligible overhead. And that difference may cause you to look in the wrong place to tune something. Another important issue for data collection is scalability. Um, how big a program can you deal with? And canonical programs we talk about might be 300 megabytes of an executable, which is built with 100,000 source files. I would, not, I would say this is a very large program, but by no means the largest that one would want to deal with. You also need to deal with high counts of threads. For some applications, especially petascale applications that are being developed um, by government labs, um, thousands of threads may be running, and you need to deal with that many threads. Sometimes you have to deal with a variance in running time. For some programs, it's fine to take measurements on a few tens of seconds. For others, you really need to run for hours to understand it. So you have to have some way of scaling your data collection so it can cope with either of those ranges. Another issue in data collection is aggregation. It's, you often do not care about each individual event that you're recording for profiling or each function entry, but you need to aggregate it to get a picture in statistical sampling, for example, of what's the aggregate profile over all those events. And you have a choice about where to do that aggregation. You can do it at collection time, which has the advantage that you have much lower data volume, but you do have higher overhead, and you've lost detail. Once you've done the aggregation, you cannot disaggregate in retrospect when you're examining the data. On the other hand, in post-collection aggregation, you have the problem that you're generating a large volume of data, perhaps more than you can handle very easily, but you do get the more detailed information and lower overhead in collection. Overhead in examining the data, we think, is less important than overhead in doing the data collection. So another issue with data collection is who's doing the collection? There are two easy ways to think about it. One is you can do it in the target itself. And that's the method that um, I've used pri primarily to deal with user codes. You can do it either by compilation options that insert the instrumentation, or better to use some LD preload mechanism that actually inserts your data collector into the target's address space. You're then collecting it from the target itself. There's lower overhead, and it's, it's easier to control, but there are many little tricky end cases you have to deal with, especially if you want to either manage multiple processes. For example, one of the features in our tools is the ability to understand when your process is creating descendants, when it forks, when it execs something else, and you may want to trace all of those. Like database servers often fork many processes for their clients. Another problem with collecting it um, from the target itself is that interposition for tracing can be pretty tricky to do. It's often very hard to get exactly the right interposition in just the right place. In fact, we're dealing right now with a problem where several layers of interposition manage to trigger needing to extend the file, which triggers um, a call back into um, our own code and leads to funny behavior. But we've, we're fixing that. The other way of collecting the data is through some external monitoring process. It has higher overhead, but much more control. So you have much. You can have better controls over what you're doing to the target. Um, on the other hand, it usually needs pretty heavy-duty kernel support, often very much what you need for a debugger. And the real downside of it is that the overhead can be really substantial because you may have to, you may have to intrude on the process in order, for example, to unwind its stack. And that may cause a pretty significant delay. There are lots of different technologies that you can use to get at the data that you want. Um, each has strengths and weaknesses, and it's always a trade-off, as with everything in programming. Um, one technology for understanding how a program is running is to use a cycle-accurate simulator. This is great. You get really good data. Another way is to collect with either compiled-in or patched-in instrumentation. It gives you a way to get precise execution counts, for example. You can also trace interesting events, for example, lock contention events or malloc and free events. Um, or, and this is my favorite, you can do statistical sampling. Um, 
statistics really work well. And if what you're interested in is the aggregate behavior over a significant amount of time, statistics are the best way to get to it. And I'll talk in some detail about the trade-offs for each of these. When you're doing statistical sampling, you can either sample PCs or, as we prefer, you can sample call stacks. That gives you the context information of how you got to the hotspot in your code. So running in a simulator. Running in a simulator is really great because it can give you absolutely accurate behavior on what's going on in the machine, especially for CPU usage. It's less helpful for I.O. or paging I.O. But again, depends on what you're looking for, which technology you want to use. The con of using um, cycle accurate simulators is that they can have enormous dilation. It can take you an hour to run a five second snippet in the execution of a process. It also depends on how accurate the cycle accurate simulator really is. And most of them, despite what they say, aren't quite as accurate as they might be. There are some corner cases they don't quite handle right. Often that's not a problem, but sometimes it is. But using a simulator is terrible in terms of scalability. Um, you, need, you may need to run for weeks in order to understand the performance of a tiny application on a, uh, on a simulator. Another technology is to compile in or patch in instrumentation. That has an obvious dependency on the compiler, and that may produce a really different program depending on what kind of instrumentation you asked for. For example, if you ask for accurate function counts, you no longer can do inlining of functions because you can't quite get the count for that right. There are lots, if you're looking for line, accurate line information like TCOV does, then you've got the problem that now you're inhibiting optimizations that may move instructions around lines. But the advantage of it is that you can get whatever you want. And a couple, uh, one tool I'm familiar with is Pixie, which was done at, originally at MIPS and SGI, which takes an executable and transforms it to collect counts for uh, instruction execution. And you can also take compiled object, it does compiled object code transformation. And there are many other related programs that do the same sort of thing. The disadvantage is that actually patching transformations to do instrumentation can be extremely challenging. Um, depending on the instruction set architecture you're dealing with and the peculiarities of various instructions, it may be very, very difficult to do just the right kind of uh, transformation. And dilation may also be a problem. For Pixie in particular, typical dilation was 3 to 7x, which is pretty high. Another technology you can use is tracing, which means you can trace interesting events. Now, in Solaris 10 and later, there's a very powerful mechanism called dtrace that was developed by the kernel group that pretty much allows you to trace anything you want. Um, makes it a bit harder to get kind of generic information because you have to pick what you want to trace. You can also do interposition. Uh, for example, the MPI libraries have hooks in them for, called PMPI, which allow you to pick up, to allow you to interpose on any one of the interesting calls and call your code first, then call the real code, then call your code afterwards. And that means you can do whatever measurements you want in that interval. Um, any kind of tracing can get you very interesting data. You can get memory allocation and deallocation data. You can get message passing information from MPI. You can get synchronization, excuse me, synchronization operations like mallox and freeze. The con is that it requires a lot of care. You have to do pretty careful um, interposition to make sure you're getting it just right. And it also doesn't scale well. Tracing technologies in general generate data for every event that passes through. And the longer you run, the more events you care about, the larger the data volume, and the harder it is to process. The last technology I'll talk about is statistical sampling. And this I very much like. The advantage, you can, you can sample either program counters or call stacks. 
the la the, if you sample only program counters, all you can get is what we refer to as exclusive metrics. Metrics spent, time spent in this function or this source line or this in instruction. Whereas if you sample call stacks, you can get inclusive time as well. The time spent in this function and everything that it called. You can understand how the time spent in matrix multiply propagates up to all the various callers of it. So that, that's actually my favorite kind of technology. One big advantage of it is that it's very scalable. It's inherently scalable because if you're doing statistical sampling, you can throttle how frequently you do the sampling depending on how long the run is, how fine a granularity of the data you want. And statistics really do work. Um, many users somehow don't trust something that's not 100% reproducible. And I cannot tell you how many times in the last 10 or 15 years, I've gotten a complaint from a user who said, I ran this little program that only runs for a tenth of a second, and I did your profile on it, and I did it twice, and I got two completely different profiles. They don't quite understand that statistical profiling only makes sense if you have a large enough space to do your statistics. In fact, in the current release of our tools, we will post a warning if there are too few events so that we think that the statistics are not meaningful. The disadvantage of statistics is that you've got to be a little bit careful on how you trigger it because the worst thing you can do with statistical sampling is have your statistical sample trigger in a way that's correlated with the actual behavior of the program. You do that and you will get unbelievably distorted and confusing results. Um, there are several techniques for coping with that. You can either induce jitter in your over in your profiling interval, or you can make sure that the profiling interval, especially for hardware counters, is such that it's very unlikely you can construct a program that has the same cycle as your profiling cycle. Um, not impossible, but if you profile, let's say, on one interval that's close to 10 to the eighth, but is a nice prime number, and another one that's close to half of 10 to the eighth and is also a nice prime number, it's virtually impossible to write a program that will get correlations with both of those. Um, another disadvantage of using statistical sampling for data collection is that you may miss rare events, but I would argue that for performance monitoring, rare events don't matter. Um, if they don't show up in the statistics, they're not important enough to be affecting your overall performance. Another issue about data collection is understanding symbols. Um, most of the technologies that are used for doing instrumentation and measurement get raw data in the form of addresses, either program counter addresses or data addresses. And you need to understand how that address relates back to what the user wrote. Which function is this really? And that means that you need to record, at the same time you're recording your profiles, you need to record a time-dependent address space map. Um, one of the corner cases that the tools have to deal with is running this application, it DL opens a shared object, then it closes it, then it DL opens something else. You now have the case where you may have the same address has a very different meaning at two different points in the execution of the program. There are ways to deal with this. We do it by interposing on um, DL open and DL close. We interpose on MMAP to understand how data addresses um, uh, change. There are also other techniques based on what the kernel can do. Um, Sun's runtime linker has something called LD audit, which allows, which allows you to put in an agent that will get reported to whenever the address space changes. Another issue is that to get symbols right for some kinds of programs, you really need to be informed when the program does something. So for Java, we use the JVMTI uh, interface, which will tell us whenever Hotspot generated dynamic code for us for user methods. We also have an API that anyone can use. If they write code in their data space and then jump to it, they can tell us where this code is and what we should call it so it will show up normally in the profile. So that's all I really want to say about data collection. And now I'll talk about the presentation issues. As I said before, we think it's very important to present data in the context of the user's model of their code. 
And for some compilers or languages, that can be pretty tricky. Um, for C++, for example, different C++ compilers do different name mangling, and you really need to understand how to, how to do that so you can present the method the user wrote and not the symbol as it appears in the symbol table. Java has a problem that, first of all, it has its own name mangling, but it also has hotspot compiled code where sometimes a, co a particular method is being interpreted. Sometimes it's, it was compiled by the Java runtime and now it's being executed in machine mode. Is that the same function or is it not? Um, we think most users think it is the same function and they want to know how much time was spent in that function. Another issue is OpenMP. When you do parallelization, as I said before, you can generate these outline functions or M functions. And they get called in a particularly funny way, um, often through various layers of the runtime, often in different ways in a master thread and a slave thread. And I'll talk about that in more detail later. I also think it's very important to have a graphical user interface. And as I said, there are people who think that real users don't use GUIs, but I'm not one of those people. I think that a picture is worth many, many thousands of words, megabytes of words. And so getting the right image can really help you understand your program. You need to navigate through the data. That is, you need to bring up a screen that shows you kind of the, the right thing to look at first. And from there, you need to be able to navigate it. In the tools I've developed, the first thing that comes up is usually a function list with metrics of performance for each function. So I'll see user CPU time or cache misses against various functions. Click on a function, I can go to its source, I can look at its disassembly, I can see who called it and who it calls and so forth. Another really important thing is a timeline that is showing the profile events in a line that goes across time. And doing that allows the user to exploit the single most powerful pattern recognition device on Earth, which is namely the human mind. You can look at a picture and see instantly a correlation that it would be extraordinarily difficult to write an algorithm to pick up from the raw data. However, graphical user interfaces are not everything. There are times that you really want command line interfaces. You want to be able to script analysis sometimes. And um, especially for testing, it's very good to have command line access to the data so you can do automatic test and verification. I'll talk about that later as well. So I'm going to talk in detail about two particular issues for presentation, Java and OpenMP. Problem with Java is that you might naively think that the JVM is just some plain C++ program. Well, yes it is. But on the other hand, it's really a pretty peculiar C++ program. For one thing, um, the first thing the JVM does when it starts is it actually constructs the Java interpreter in its own data space. One humongous function, so 35 kilobytes. Another thing is that in Java, especially mixed Java, you may be bridging between Java and JNI and native code and back again. And we need to understand how to undo that operation to reflect the data back in the user's model. And for hotspot compiler, a hotspot comes in, it takes a method, makes uh, machine code for it, and now suddenly you're executing different addresses, different places, but it's still the same method. In fact, I believe in some of the, Java, the JVMs, it may dynamically recompile a, a particular function many times. If it decides that the compiled version is still not fast enough, it may recompile it with higher optimization, more on inlining. So we need to deal with all of that. Another peculiarity of Java is that there are many threads. Um, there are all the user threads, which are visible to the user. But there's a number of what we call JVM system threads. Uh, we used to call them overhead threads, but the JVM folks made us change that. So now they're called JVM system. Um, another interesting property of Java is that there are really two call stacks that make sense if you're doing call stack sampling. One is the Java call stack that is the call stack that shows which method and which uh, bytecode index called which other method and so forth. But there's also a native stack. And sometimes you need one, sometimes you need the other. 
In particular, if you're dealing with Java, mixed Java C++, the only way to get a good user picture of what's going on is to take the Java call stack and the native call stack and stitch them together to put the native, the J and I call stuff in the middle of where it really belongs in the user's Java. So I'll go through a little example, a toy application that I wrote called JSynProg. Synprog is synthetic program, and the J is because this is the Java version. There was also a C version that we did earlier. In user mode, what you really want to see are the methods, functions that the user wrote, sorted by some metric. Um, we have a side panel. You collect, select any function. In a side panel, we'll show you everything that we measured for that method so that you don't have the problem of having 20 different measurements in 20 different columns of data that you can't quite pick out. You can select which ones you want to see and which ones you don't and which ones you want to sort by. You also want to see callers and callees with attribution of the metrics up and down the stack. And um, you want to see annotated source. You want to see how much time was spent on each line of the program you're dealing with. For mixed model Java and, and C or C++, you really want to see a seamless transition, although I don't have slides that show this. If you run such a code and you look at a Java code that's calling into JNI, you'll step into a, a, a method from the Java into a method from C++. You can step down the C++ methods, and then you can step down when it goes back into Java, and the transition is seamless. You see what's really going on. Um, for Java, there are people, and frankly, I think these are mostly the JVM developers, who care about this assembly. And they want to see, in Java mode, they want to see what the JV, Java bytecode is that's being interpreted and how much time was spent on each of those bytecodes. For machine code, you really want to see the actual machine code and the instructions and how much time was spent on each of those. So here's a picture of a screenshot of our current tool in Java mode. So this is user mode. It's showing what we expect the users to see. So we have two metrics, um, user CPU for both of them. But the one that has a little dangles on it is the inclusive user time. The one that doesn't is the exclusive user time. And you can see different numbers for them. And in this case, the bold face shows that's what I'm sorting by. So you see, not surprisingly, the top of the call stack is JSynProg main, because that's where the work is done. And although you can't see it here, some of these methods are Java methods, but some, like cfunc, um, is in fact a, a, C++, um, a C or C++ function. Another thing I want to show you here is this line that says, no Java call stacks reported. And you can see it's about maybe 2% or thereabouts of, well, 1.5% of the total runtime. In order to get Java call stacks, we actually has, have to ask the JVM to do it for us. And in order for the JVM to safely unwind the call stack, it has to be at what it calls a safe point. That is, it has to know that, for example, it's not in the midst of moving garbage collection or doing garbage collection or moving memory around. And so we made the, the value decision that Rather than introducing a safe point at every profile interrupt, we, we specify the call that the JVM used, that we use in the JVM to be, hey, if it's not safe to unwind it, don't. Just return us an error. And this no Java call stack recorded represents all the cases where that happened. And as you can see, it's only a couple percent, probably not significant in the total execution of the run. So here's a picture of the timeline. I said um, we have this timeline that allows you to pick out patterns. And what you move that out of the way. And what you see here are change in pattern in the behavior of the code. Now, I said this is a synthetic program. And that means each one of these little different patterns represents some little bit of code that we thought was typical of a typical Java code. Um, these really tall stacks here are uh, recursion. Um, one of them is recursion deeper than we support data collection for. The other one is 
deep recursion, but not. And this one is something we call bouncing, where A calls B calls A calls B calls A calls B. And again, this code was written primarily as a test case, but it's also a pretty good demo for what the code does. Uh, you see there's a line here, and although you can't tell, this bar is whiter, not gray, that the cross hatch between those two represents the specific event collected. And when you select an event, this is what you see for it. It shows you what the event was. In this case, it was a clock profile tick. It tells you the timestamp, the timestamp, how much time it represents, what state it was in. Um, the Solaris keeps track of what it calls microstate accounting. So we distinguish user CPU from system CPU, from page fault weight or CPU weight. But we get profile ticks with all of those counts. And lastly, it shows the call stack at what happened at that particular place. In this case, the Java, user's Java is single threaded, even though the JVM, when it's running, has, a, I think, a dozen threads. We also support another way of looking at it called machine mode, in which we actually record the data, at, we actually display the data as shown. Um, this is really the implementation model, and that means when the, the JVM is interpreting code, we see the JVM interpreter. We're basically only looking at native stacks for all threads. And we show all threads. So even the Java threads show, the, show a native stack. And that means that for the most part, you see interpreter. Timeline shows all threads as well, both the user's thread, the garbage collector thread, or threads, depending on which garbage collector you're using the hotspot compiler thread, and a bunch of other threads, some of which I don't even understand what they do. I, mean, I think there's the one that's there only to deal with when the process terminates. So here's the same timeline on the same experiment, but now we're looking in machine mode. So the first thing to notice is this top thread, which is the user's thread, now looks qualitatively quite different. And that's because what you're seeing here are methods in the interpreter. A couple of other threads to point out. One is um, thread 2, which is the garbage collector thread. And another is this thread 7, which is the hotspot compiler thread. This shows you what really is happening, but it doesn't relate very well to what the user expects to see. So we implemented a third mode, what we call expert user mode. It's a compromise between user mode that only shows the stuff the user wrote and the machine mode, which shows far more detail than the users want to do. What we do is for Java threads, that is users' Java threads, we actually show the Java call stack. For non-Java threads, like the garbage collector and so forth, we show the native stack where it makes sense. And the timeline shows all those stacks. And that can be very useful. I'll show you why in a moment. Um, we also separate the consequence of doing this is that we now, instead of seeing JVM system for all of the overhead of the garbage collector and the compiler and so forth, we'll now see those individual methods so the user can understand what's happening. And the timeline shows all threads. And that turns out to be very useful. Um, so here's an example of that same experiment, except now it's in expert mode. So you'll notice that the, oops. You'll notice this line now looks pretty much like it did before. It's different at the very beginning, which is actually the initialization of the JVM, um, which is before it gets into user mode. Because you're now seeing native stacks here before the thread becomes a Java thread. But after that, what you're seeing is just like you saw in the Java thing. But now you're also seeing these other, these other um, threads which show you what's happening in the code. In particular, let me look at, Java two, at thread two, which is where I've collected which is where I've selected an event. In particular, it's right in here, where it's not this uninteresting pattern here, but there's actually something going on. And you can see from the call stack something is really going on. And you can guess from the names that this is the garbage collector. What it means is that now, whenever you see a spike of activity in the garbage collector thread, you can move up to the native thread and see what's happening. Um, I don't have slides for that, because this talk is a, more on how to do tools and how to use our tool. But what you could do, for example, here, select this region where there's a lot of garbage collecting going on, move up to the next level. And what you'll actually see in this case is the, 
the user Java code is allocating a huge array inside a loop, and it just keeps overwriting the same array, which means it's creating garbage as fast as its little legs can carry it. So I think that's all I want to say about Java. Uh, oh, I'll talk about how we do the reconciliation. Um, in order to get this right, we need support from the JVM. We use JVM TI. We can also support older JVMs that have an older interface called JVM PI. And that allows us to get thread identification, hotspot compilation, and deletion of methods. And we have a method that we, that we persuaded the JVM folks to implement to give us a, an async signal safe unwind of the Java call stack. Um, I could not persuade them to put it in the JVM TI spec, however. So it's just there. And some people outside have stumbled upon that and realized what it must do and have exploited it. Open the VM. Excuse me? Open the VM. Hey, I think that's the right thing to do. I'm glad other people are using it. Um, we, can, we also asked the JVM, and they agreed to do for us, to use our API to describe where the interpreter is in its space, where they put various bits of bridge code between Java and native, and so forth, so we can get a pretty good idea as to what's really in the address space. Um, the presentation changes we did are based on whether or not we have thread IDs. That tells us whether this is a Java thread or not and whether we have Java call stacks or not. Um, so I think that is the end of Java. So I've talked about the issues in compiling the code, the issues in um, collecting the data, and presentation for Java. And now I'll talk about presentation for another programming model that has a fair amount of complexity in it, specifically OpenMP. OpenMP is a scheme for doing parallelization in codes. You can say parallel do, parallel regions, and various other constructs within it. And the specification for OpenMP is written only in terms of the user model. Problem is that nobody implements OpenMP that way. OpenMP is always implemented with a whole lot of runtime magic and the actual execution behavior isn't much like what the user thinks is going on. I'll get into that a bit later. So presentation, you certainly want to show the user what they expect in the user model. But sometimes you really want to see what is actually going on in the runtime. Uh, but the actual data is recorded in, in the implementation model, not in the user's model. But the tools are smart enough to undo that. So I'll go through an example of two-level nested parallelism in, in OpenMP. So what are the characteristics of the user model? First of all, when, when you have a serial code that goes into a parallel region, it's what's called a fork join model. It forks, and now you have n threads executing in parallel. When the parallel region is finished, it joins up, and you're back to only one thread. And in the user model, all the threads are the same. Once you're in a parallel region, the master and the slave threads have no distinction between them. However, the data is, ex is, ex is collected in the implementation model. And in the implementation model, the execution really takes place in this outline function, or M function, that represents the body of a parallel loop, for example. And the M function, as called in the native model, is different between the master and the slave. Um, most implementations do have outline functions. They have different naming conventions, depending on who wrote the compiler. Uh, we're perfectly good at compiling code generated by our compiler, about understanding code generated from our compiler, less good about other compilers. And there's another interesting issue, which is CPU time is not necessarily the same as work time. In particular, in OpenMP, you can say, I can either do a sleep wait or a busy wait. Um, you want to do a busy wait if you really don't have any use for the CPUs otherwise. And you want to be very responsive in waking up when suddenly you go parallel again and you have use for these other threads. So you can park them in a busy wait, which is spinning as fast as it can to look to see if any new work has come in. There's also a sleep wait, 
which doesn't use CPU time. It goes to sleep. And then when work comes in, it relies on something to wake up that thread. But to the user, both of those are weights. And the user doesn't really care whether you're doing user CPU time or sleep time. But it means that user CPU time will be much higher if you're doing busy weight. So to fix that, we created another metric called um, OMP work. And that does, never happens when you're waiting for something. Whether you're busy waiting or not waiting, you're in OMP wait state. If you are executing in the user code or in single threaded, you are in OMP work state. So here's the timeline as a user would expect to see it. You'll notice the first thread, the initial thread comes along. It then goes parallel, and you'll notice that all of these threads look the same. They all have the same call stack. You can tell from the shape. The leaf PC will be different, of course, because they're executing asynchronously. But in general, they'll be in the same function. Um, and this is, in fact, what nested parallel parallelism looks in that model. So you see start, which is where all programs start, calls main, which calls work, which then calls this outline function. This is its real name, but this is how we translate it. That then calls a function called compute sum, but compute sum has embedded within it another level of parallel. So what you're seeing is the outer nest and the inner nest of parallelization in this code. In the implementation model, the threads look really different because the master master shows that it was started from start calling main and so forth. The first level slave, which I call the slave master, shows a descent from LWP start, which is where threads are created. And it will show both levels of nesting. However, the, the slave slave, that is the second level slave caused by the nested parallelism, only shows descent from LWP start directly into the M function. So this is what the, the stacks look like. Here's the master thread. Here are the, it goes parallel with four threads. And here are the four threads. You'll notice the three slaves look one way. The master looks different. And here, and there are more below this, are the slave-slave threads, the ones that are created for the inner nest. In particular, here are the call stacks for the three different kinds. The master master shows you starting from, st from main. And now this differs from the user model in that you suddenly see things like empty master function, run job, invoke mfunc, empty master, et cetera. This represents the OpenMP runtime, which we abstract away from the user model because they don't really care. In the slave master, that is a slave thread that is a master of a region itself, you see it's starting up. It's immediately in the M function, calls another function, and now it looks like the master. Slave thread starts at LWP start and finds itself immediately in the inner nest. So these are the different call stacks that we really measure. But we transform it so that it matches the user model. And we do various bits of magic for it. Uh, first thing that we do is that when a thread forks, that is when, it, I don't mean fork in Unix fork, but when it goes into a parallel region, creates slave threads, we track the master's call stack at fork events. Um, we actually won't do that anymore, and I'll explain why in a second. We assign each parallel region a unique ID. And we unwind the stack and save the top part of the call stack, the part that's above the OpenMP runtime. And we associate that with each region ID. When we get a profile event, we capture the current call stack. But we also ask the OpenMP library, what's your current uh, region ID? And the unwind we do is, this, is at the bottom of the call stack, below the OpenMP runtime. And when we do the analysis, we actually stitch these two together. We do the reconciliation so that we take the top part of the master stack, stitch it with the bottom of the slave stack, and that represents the call stack in the user model. And we do exactly the same reconciliation for a fork event that's inside a parallel region. We take its master call stack, we stitch it together with the master call stack of where it was created to get the user model call stack. And we also add pseudo functions 
when it, we're not in the OpenMP work state, that is when the code is waiting at a barrier or waiting for something else, we show it as being in a different function. Now I said before, I said we capture the call stack at fork event, and that was true when I first wrote this talk. However, we discovered a significant performance problem in doing that. Um, many, many people and many libraries use OpenMP parallelism for very tiny parallel regions. I think in general this is a mistake because you have all the, parallel, all the overhead of going parallel and you're not gaining much because it's such a tiny region. But the serious performance consequence for us came here. We wound up spending an enormous amount of time unwinding master stacks at a fork event and recording the data. But it turned out when we did the post analysis, we never saw a profile event that referred to it. Who cares? Why are we doing this? And the trick to fix this, which we've just recently put into our code, is to recon recognize that after the fork event finishes at the join event, when you're about to return back to the original single thread code, you're in the same place in the user code as you were when you did the fork. So what we do now is we, we still generate a region ID. We do not unwind the stack. But we associate it with each region ID a bit that says, do we care about this or not? And every time we get a profile event that asks for a region ID, we mark that bit saying we care. No such events came, came in. The region ID is shown as not interesting. At the join point, we simply return and ignore it. If we do get the bit that says you use this, then we record the event. And this reduced our data volume for many cases by more than an order of magnitude and changed our dilation for these pathological cases where the code has tiny parallel regions from a factor of 5 or 6 to the normal 5 or 6 percent. So I've talked about what kinds of measurements to do, how you prepare your code, what the data collection technologies are, what the presentation technologies are. Now I'll talk about validation. Um, it's really important if you're doing performance tools to make sure you get the right answer. One wild goose chase that you've sent the user off on means they'll never look at your tool again. They say, I wasted three days because it told me the wrong thing. I won't believe anything it says. So you've got to get that right. And the first law of programming is if it ain't tested, it don't work. And so you've got to be really careful to make sure you do testing. What I believe is the right thing to do is to do automated nightly testing. At Sun and at SGI, we build our tools every night. We run a very large test suite. Um, test has several hundred tests. And we run it on, at, at this point, some 35 different machines. Um, we have different machines for different chip types because hardware counter profiling is different on different machines. We have all too many different flavors of Linux because every Linux system is different. And um, as it turned out, every time we were asked to support a different flavor of Linux, we had to make source code changes. So far, and I'm crossing my fingers, we have one source base that works for all the different Linuxes. But it's been uh, quite an adventure. Um, I'm not a real fan of Linux for that reason. Anyway, we do different tests for different OSs, different compilers, different chips. Um, optimizations in different compilers are different, and we have to deal with all of those. And we want to make sure that they work. So for some kinds of data, you know the measurements are exact. If you're doing function counts, you can be pretty count confident that you've got the exact count. And you run it again, you'll get the same count. Turns out that that's not quite true. For example, and again, this is, this is a war story. I did profiling. I couldn't understand why instruction counts for fprintf were different. Well, it turns out it executes differently depending on the string it's trying to convert. And in particular, for dates and timestamps, we got different counts, different execution counts. And there are other exceptions like this. Um, for exact measurements, it's pretty easy to validate by comparing to a gold file. You know what the answer is supposed to be. Make sure you get the same answer. But you have to have done the step of validating the gold file the first time, making sure that what it does makes sense. 
Another kind of validation that's important is regenerating the output from pre-recorded data. We record experiments and we run the same script to look at all the reports from it every night and make sure, by God, we got exactly the same answer from today's run as we did from yesterday's run. There's a bit of, of work to get that right because when you fix a bug, when you change a behavior because you've decided to present something in a bit more graceful fashion, you have to change the gold file, but that's pretty straightforward. A more difficult problem is validation for statistical sampling, where now your results are not precisely reproducible. And we do that by, by using tailored targets. We build programs like the SYNPROG and JSYNPROG I talked about that do their own measurements at runtime and generate what we refer to as an accounting file. So they say how much total time, how much CPU time was spent in each method. They write this out in the file. Um, and mind you, this takes quite a lot of engineering effort to develop. So we then run the experiment. We look at the accounting file. We look at the output from the tool. And we write a Perl script that compares the data and makes sure that it's close enough. Um, you have to have error margins because of, these are statistical. And we say for some kinds of data, 5% and 500 milliseconds is an anomaly that's so large it's a problem. For other kinds of data, we restrict it to only 2% 2 and 200 milliseconds. Another I issue about validation is bulletproofing. And that means you've got to construct test cases for all the corner cases you can think of. All the strange things that you've ever seen a program do, do, you need to get a test case for. And also, whenever you find a bug and fix it, you, in general, want to incorporate a test case for that bug in the test suite. And that's mostly what we do. So I've talked about what I think are the issues in developing industrial strength performance tools, what, how you measure them, how you present the data, how you validate the answers you get. And I'll be happy to take any questions. I think we have time for a couple questions, if uh, anybody has anything in particular. Yeah. Um, so what do you do when you, have a lot more, when you have a lot more data than will fit on the screen? Like, Say you have 1,000 pixels horizontally, mm -hmm. but you have a million or 10 million statistical points. You can't show all those um, in your timeline. Or what if you have 1,000 threads? You, know, you can only show maybe 10. We don't or, do a good job with the th the threads, but for events, we do. You'll notice there's a little black line here. That shows that's present only when you have multiple events that map to the same pixel. It's actually, I think, a pair of pixels, because you can't see a pattern on one pixel. And um, in order to see what's going on, you can zoom in. Um, let's see. This, these set of buttons zoom in, zoom out, or go back to full screen. And you can also use this to navigate among events. You can move left or right or up and down. So you can move from here, you can either move to this bar, or from here, you can move to this bar or that bar, or you can move left and right. And if you zoom in, eventually you can zoom in far enough that every individual profile event will show up. And the, that black line at the bottom will disappear. And what happens vertically if your call stack is 100 frames? It looks uh, like you can only display. It's a, it's a know, user 10. control how many you want to see. But however many are visible, you will always, if you select an event, will always show you the full call stack. So you, you can control how many frames you want to see. You can also control whether you want to see it from the leaf or the root. That is, you want to start from main and go up, or you want to start from leaf and go down however many frames you want to see. I think, there, I think there are other techniques we can use to do better job on this, but we just haven't had the resources to do that yet. And for threading, that's, a, of course, a more serious problem. We can selectively decide which threads to show and which threads not to show. And if you have multiple kinds of data, for each kind of data, you'll see a different bar here. So if we had a hardware counter, for process one, thread one, we'd have clock profiling. We'd also have one for hardware counters. And you can select which ones of, of those you want to do. What we're expecting to do next is to allow the user more freedom to rearrange which ones we want to see. Yeah? Um, 
So this measures only the program that's running. If you had a bunch of other programs running on the computer and you get swapped out or something, you don't see that effect in this? Well, you, you can't tell what, uh, when the we cause? Sh by default, we only show user inclusive and exclusive CPU time. However, um, we do record, as I said, on Solaris, we have microstate accounting. So we will record a packet that says waiting for CPU. And you can, there are buttons in the interface here. Uh, this one is the data presentation button. And all these guys have tool tips so you can figure out what they are. Uh, you can turn on how much weight CPU and see which functions were spent waiting for CPU. Um, we, we found that there's actually surprisingly little distortion when you're recording data and other processes are running. Um, most of our tests pass anyway. A lot of our tests pass simply because the target and the measurement are seeing the same kind of disruptions due to other processes. So we still get a match, and that's what matters. I'm, I'm wondering how you deal with multiple, say, multiple runs. Like in working with tools like this, it's great to do before and after benchmark, mm -hmm. or before and after an optimization. Is, does your tool have anything built in to deal with uh, that? Alas, no. It's one of our oldest RFEs was how to do comparison. Comparison of the same program in multiple runs is relatively straightforward. But when you talk about before and after, it gets a whole lot trickier. What does it mean? How many times was this function called if in one run it's been inlined and the other one it hasn't? Um, how much time was spent in a function when you've suddenly moved, when you've transformed the code so you've moved a lot of the work that it's doing into some other function? How do you do that comparison? And um, it's a very hard problem. We are hoping to address it, but we don't quite have the resources it will take to do it in the near term. Yeah. Do you, do you have any methods to, in this to uh, correlate un, seemingly unrelated events, such as cache misses at the same time as you have an I load, I load byte code? Uh, a what kind of code? Uh, Java, a byte code that's like load an integer onto the stack. Um, for, well, for things like this, the correlation between cache miss that you just don't okay. see until you put it on a timeline in one direction. Oh, oh no, no, no. Well, we see cache misses because we can profile based on hardware counters. Right. And if you profile based on, let's say, the DNE cache miss counter, you will see all the hits will show up on those functions and instructions that are having the cache misses. In fact, the Spark chips have a really great counter called. Um, cache recirculate counters, a set of them. And this represents not the number of times you missed in cache, but the number of cycles you stalled waiting for your cache request to come in. And that's really nice because it reports directly in time. And one of the things that we can do, although in the current tools it takes two experiments, is you can profile based on cycles, d &E cache misses, uh, e d cache misses, i cache misses, and CPU time. And if you profile on all of those, you can actually see a function and see difference between user CPU time and cycle time turns out to be time when the kernel thinks you're in user mode and the chip thinks you're in system mode, which turns out to be mostly TLB misses. So you see that right away. You can see that cycle time is time executing, but the DNE cache stall time is time spent waiting for the DNE cache. Subtract that out, you know what's going on. You see the D cache. Subtract it from D and E cache, and you see the E cache time. So you really can see each component in the memory subsystem and what its costs were. Uh, one last question, perhaps. Um, so I'm sure lots of Sun's customers are building clusters these days, a mm -hmm. uh, very popular way to go. Most of what you've talked about, though, has been more oriented towards debugging a single node application. Yes. Uh, do you have any favorite tools uh, or techniques uh, from what you've seen for, for dis distributed system performance analysis? Well, most of the clusters we see in our experience, in high performance computing at least, do MPI communications. Our tool supports MPI profiling by tracing the MPI API calls, although it does, I would say, a moderate to mediocre job in dealing with it. We're putting more effort into getting that right. There are a lot of issues involved in clusters, especially if you want to see correlations between what's happening on two different nodes. 
got to make sure you're synchronizing the clocks or know what the difference between the two clocks are in order to see that so you can at least preserve the before or after issue. Um, you know, we started this, this project was actually started 10, 15 years ago. And in the last, it's only been the last several years that clusters have been become important to our business. So Sun is now putting the effort into understanding that better. But I understand that for you folks, clusters are perhaps a bit more important. <laughs> you don't have a million CPU single address space system, do you? No, not yet. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity.